Two decades of Irish postcolonial scholarship has certainly demonstrated that the book is an essential fictional exploration of a late stage of Irish colonial struggle. Such work, of course, does not eclipse the novel status as a seminal piece of modernism, nor lessen other avenues of inquiry, such as its psychoanalytic investigations. Nearly a century after its appearance, the density of Joyce's work is yet to be fully weighed, and all but the most ideological readers affirm Ulysses contains numerous tracts of holistic interpretation. And yet, although the novel is also an invaluable confrontation of its era's anti-Semitism and Jewish identity struggle, Jewish scholars still often remain reluctant to raise these themes to the status of others. Aside from being an Irish nationalist novel, or an expose on human sexuality, or a revolutionary linguistic time bomb, is Ulysses also a Jewish novel? Is it, more strictly speaking, an Irish Jewish novel? And if it is either or both, why the resistance to continue to explore it as such? There are scholars who argue the subject is an artificial implication of a minor note in Joyce's work, a counterassertion that, to my mind at least, hints at accusations of Jewish cultural acquisitiveness. Perhaps it's also not unreasonable to suggest both left and liberal discontent with the politics of Israel plays a role in this. The novel confronts the transition from the colonized psyche to a post-colonial awareness, and the assertion that Israel is a site of the post-colonial Jewish condition makes for some readers a bitter pill to swallow. Nevertheless, such a respective demotion of a cornerstone of the novel's narrative remains a dangerous avoidance behavior. If we don't maintain a steady investigative eye on what Joyce offers us surrounding Jews, Jewishness, and anti-Semitism, we risk misunderstanding how both the Holocaust and the decolonized West continue to define our postmodern world. One controversy surrounding Ulysses as a Jewish novel also intersects the contemporary argument over art and politics as always local, against the belief that the most salient interpretations rely on wider contexts, such as religious or intellectual history, revolutionary politics, or liberal humanism. Joyce himself was interested in this schism. In a conversation in 1920 with an ambitious Arthur Powers, who confessed to modeling his writing on French satire, Joyce rebuffed him, quote, you will never do it. You are an Irishman and you must write in your own tradition. Write what is in your blood, not in your brain, end quote. This last assertion of tradition and blood, it deemed seems ironic from the author of Ulysses. But Joyce was unrelenting in his belief in the efficacy of nation and cultural temperament. All great international writers, he claims, quote, were first national. It was the intensity of their own nationalism which made them international in the end, as in the case of Turgenev. For myself, he added, I always write about Dublin, because if I can get to the heart of Dublin, I can get to all the cities of the world. In the particular is contained the universal." End quote. The statement could be seen as a rallying cry for how scholars such as Seamus Dean, and Declan Kybert, James Fairhall, Enda Duffy, Emer Nolan, Maria Tomoshko, Andrew Gibson, and others have reclaimed Joyce's work as a site of Irish colonial resistance, indeed, as an Irish Ireland novel, only without much Gaelic. But how does this scholarship reposition Ulysses as a Jewish novel? Was this too in Joyce's blood? The same 20 years of Joyce's Irish reclamation also saw the publication of Irene Adele's Joyce and the Jews, my own James Joyce Ulysses and the Construction of Jewish Identity, Marilyn Riesbaum's Joyce's Judaic Other, and John McCourt's The Years of Bloom, James Joyce and Trieste, 1904-1920. With these works, it now seems clear that Joyce was greatly interested in the culture, psychology, and political position of European Jewry during his era, and that the laboratory for this was first his hometown of Dublin, and then his adopted home of Trieste. Given these issues, tonight I want to revisit the question of how and why Joyce, a middle-class Catholic Dubliner educated at Jesuit institutions and having no Jewish relations, came to create one of the most enduring Jewish characters in modern fiction. I'm frequently asked this question by my students. Since even my best short answer proves inadequate, I often end by suggesting they read my book. Uh, rather than shameful self-promotion, however, the response is couched in the recognition that Bloom's Jewish identity is neither normative in a religious sense, nor readily understood through any single context, such as a culturally defined ethnicity, or assimilation and conversion, 
or racially based stereotypes, or even older stage Jew portraits. Late in his career, Joyce too acknowledged Bloom's depth and complexity. In responding to Jacques Mercaton's observation that Bloom had, quote, the artist's nature, Joyce segued directly into his character's Jewish identity. This is a longer quote from Joyce. You must be one of the first to have noticed. Bloom Jewish? Yes. Only a foreigner would do. The Jews were foreigners at that time in Dublin. There was no hostility toward them, but contempt, yes, the contempt people always show for the unknown, end quote. Now, Joyce assumes here that Jewishness is primarily a social question, yet also implies that Jews tend to have artistic temperaments, suggesting uh, Jewishness, uh, I'm sorry, suggesting a common and distinctly Jewish psychology as well. He asserts that the Jewish position in Ireland was ripe during his era to be exploited as a site of nationalist xenophobia. Notwithstanding such implications, given the lacunae of Bloom's halakhic Jewishness, that is, rabbinic Jewishness, he cannot be read as a rabbinically defined Jew. And let us review. His maternal grandmother was Irish Catholic. His mother was most likely raised Protestant. He's not circumcised. He might have been given a spotty Jewish education, and he does not observe mitzvot in any regular manner. Now, some readers argue that Bloom's Jewishness is tainted by Joyce's own racialist thought, and that the character is in part built from European racial assumptions, especially those of the degenerate feminized Jew of the era. And I'll come back to that concept later on in my talk. Post-colonial critics have argued that whatever the nature of Bloom's Jewishness, his politics are obviously bourgeois liberal, and so he should be read first as a middle-class Irish Dubliner, uh, then as a rationalist and atheist, and finally, perhaps a hesitant nationalist uncommitted to either republicanism or Connolly socialism, and if as a Jew at all, then most significantly unmoved by Zionism. In this reading, Bloom is a free-floating agent, a flaneur who wanders the precarious route between the Schill and Charybdis of the imperialist nationalist binary in colonial Ireland. I believe it most productive to view Bloom's Jewishness initially, at least, as the vehicle of Joyce's confrontation with modernity and its search for authentic identities, both personal and political. Through the unique version of Bloom's Jewish identity, Joyce conducts an examination of, his, of the era's controversy surrounding race and gender, religion, nation, and social inclusions and exclusions. Like other modernist writers, Joyce was critical of the constraining roles foisted on us by cultural and institutional forces, including but not limited to that of religious doctrine or colonial subjugation and the nationalist programs that reacted against it. Rather than surrender to the English liberalism, doctrinal Catholicism, Celticism, or Fenianism that so informed the Ireland of his youth, Joyce deconstructed such programs through both the substance and formal innovations of his work. By this method, he came to see Bloom's ambiguous Jewishness as an analog for the challenging, fragmented nature of his own modern, Jew modern Irish identity. But because he was Joyce, whose gargantuan talents had been honed by the Jesuits, he ended by so thoroughly investigating Bloom's ethnic background that he not only came to comprehend its complexity as a religious, cultural, temperamental, and political designation all in one, but gained an unprecedented empathy for the Jewish position, especially as a gentle writer of the modernist era. Over the course of his research and friendships with Jews on the continent, Joyce also became aware of the impact and endurance of anti-Semitism on the European mind and in Western culture in general. At the outset of World War II, he described Jew hatred to Maria Jolis as being, quote, of all prejudices, the easiest to stir up, end quote. When in doubt, he'd written years before in Ulysses, persecute Bloom. As the son of a home ruler, Joyce had been acutely aware of how the Irish Catholics had been persecuted as racially inferior by the English, whose near total disregard of native suffering during the famine years was notorious to all brands of Irish nationalism during his youth. Nor was he any less cognizant of the historic slaughter of Catholics in the name of the English Puritan mission. Quote, what about sanctimonious Cromwell and his Ironsides put the woman and children of Drogheda to the sword with the Bible text, God is love, pasted round the mouth of his cannon, as the citizen puts it in Cyclops. Previous even to that knowledge, however, Joyce's earliest Jesuit years inculcated in him the church precepts that the Jews were guilty of deicide, that the entire nation's status as a chosen people had been revoked because of this, 
and that their rootless subjugation in the modern world was punishment for that crime. As Mr. Daisy puts it in Ulysses, they sinned against the light. You can see the darkness in their eyes, and that is why they are wanderers on the earth to this day." End quote. Eventually, however, Joyce came to demythologize such foundational narratives of religious sectarianism. In rejecting bulwarks of Catholic doctrine, he sought new personal and political freedoms, and through these, also came to perceive similarities in the psychology of his own ethnic heritage and that of a Jewish sensibility. By the year she was composing Ulysses, Joyce made sub such observations to his good friend in Zurich, Ottacaro Weiss, who was cousin to Italio Svevo. In 1954, Weiss told Richard Elman that Joyce believed, quote, there were two basically different ways of thinking, the Greek and the Jewish, and that the Greek way was logical and rational, and the Jewish way impulsive, less rationally disciplined, given to fantasy and associational, end quote. But the latter profile also described to Joyce the Irish cultural temperament more than the first. In both avant-garde and bourgeois circles he entered on the continent, Joyce found assimilated Jewish intellectuals to be his literati and soon selected the Jew as a dominant trope of otherness in Ulysses. His reading of Friedrich Nietzsche's writing during this period also aided this new portrait for him, especially through the philosopher's assertion that the strength of the Jewish character was a key ingredient in the formation of a modern good Europeanism, and that's a Nietzschean concept. But Joyce also felt a personal parallel to the Jewish self-abnegation he found in many of these individuals. Their efforts to distance themselves from or deny their Jewish roots suggested to him an internalization of stereotype and the associated fear of being seen as a member of a people fixed by most European cultures as loche, inferior, cursed, and degenerate. That psychology seems to have spoken to Joyce's own self-hatred as an Irishman. As a note towards Bloom's representation of this psychology in Ulysses, Joyce jotted the Jew who, hate, who hates the Jew in the Jew in the margins of a manuscript of the Cyclops episode. In Finnegan's Wake, he further suggested the figure of Shem the Penman that introverted, sensitive, searching men of letters are metaphorical Jews in that they live through, quote, the low sham, end quote, of language's self-reflexivity. They are the evicted, the exiled in their own skin, the splintered voice in the desert continually redefining and speaking itself into existence. In their subversive and moral questioning, they write, quote, in the language of the outlaw, end quote, and, quote, are looked on with the contempt of contemptibles. Now, that last quote is from Finnegan's Wake. Jacques Derrida later echoed Joyce's sense of this internalizing self-awareness as Jewish. And this is a quote from Derrida. Quote, the only thing that begins by reflecting itself is history. And this fold, this furrow, is the Jew. The situation of the Jew becomes exemplary of the situation of the poet, the man of speech and writing, end quote. But as many as of know, Joyce was also a Shem. As he says in Finnegan's Wake, Shem is short for Seamus as Jem is jokey for Jacob. The Irish writer whose trouble past weighed on him like the mark of Cain. Joyce re reiterated this parallel on a marginal note in, Cyclops ep in the Cyclops episode, where he jotted, quote, Jews and Irish remember the past, end quote. Like the Hebraic imperative Zahor, to recall and honor, Joyce indicates that on an inescapable level, Jewishness and Irishness are history. While modernity might promise to be discursive and freeing, for such peoples, post-modernity does not arrive at the expense of an historical consciousness, of knowing oneself the bearer of the memory of martyrs. But Joyce was also politically progressive. After Bloom dredges up and weighs his past in Ulysses, he imagines a future in which his Irish-Jewish hybridity may foster a new era in both his personal psychology and warmer social relations in Dublin. Joyce thus implies in a Freudian sense that both individuals and peoples cannot move forward until they've confronted and understood their past, if perhaps only toward the end of overcoming it. Jewish's theory about an Irish-Jewish similarity was also influenced early on by a strain of land league rhetoric, I'm sorry, land league era rhetoric he encountered in childhood. Drawing on translations of the Gaelic Book of Invasions uh, from Will William Collier's History of Ireland for Schools and from the century, 17th century scholar Geoffrey Keating 
and from the linguist Charles Valencey, all of whom asserted an ancestral encounter between the Milesian Celts and the early Hebrews, home rule nationalism relied on images of the Irish likened to the enslaved Israelites under the yoke of English Egyptian rule. Both these Gaelic legends and Parnell as Moses images influenced Joyce's earliest political awareness. For his only recording of a passage of Ulysses, Joyce indeed chose his version of John F. Taylor's now famous use of this metaphor. Michael Davitt's writings and Daniel O'Connell's support of Jewish emancipation bills in the English Parliament also suggested a natural empathy between the Irish and the Jews in the modern world. By the composition of Ulysses, Jews to, jo Jews to Joyce thus became not so much mythic patriarchs or a deicidal nation, but a subjugated people similar to the Irish. Both groups' position in Europe had been circumscribed by religious and then racial prejudice. Both to him had suffered a discrediting at the hands of Western tradition. Both played crucial roles in the development of Europe, yet both were disempowered by political structures that fixed them as toxic to imperialist or nationalist programs. Both were also believed to be degenerate branches in a Darwinian frame taxonomy of racial humanity. Finally, both peoples have been long traumatized by the bloody violence of empire. Andrew Gibson has recently argued that the most accurate way to read Joyce's Jew is as, quote, a historically specific Irishman. In this way, Bloom's Jewishness becomes a functional pawn of differing political factions in home rule Ireland, and Gibson offers fresh politicized perspectives on land league Jewish-themed demagoguery, the 1904 Limerick boycott, and tensions between Catholic anti-Semitism and Unionist anti-Catholicism. Within this environment, Joyce's lessons about Hebrew patriarchs and Jewish deicide was balanced by living Jewish Dubliners whom he came in contact with during his time in the city. These include what is now understood, thanks to Terence Colleen's work, uh, as one Alfred Hunter, uh, who he believed was Jewish. Uh, we now know that uh, Alfred Hunter was not Jewish from Mr. Colleen's work. Um, uh, Joyce's maternal grandparents and father both lived on Lower Clambrassel Street in the early 1880s and had Jewish neighbors there, but contact was minimal since the area didn't become Dublin's Little Jerusalem until a decade later. There was also May Murray's Joyce's involvement with the family of Marcus Bloom and his daughters in particular, who were her teachers at the Royal Irish Academy of Music in 1888, and with whom she shared the stage in a benefit concert that year at the Church of St. Paul of the Cross in Mount Argus. Thank you, Mr. Costello. In Bray, John Joyce patronized the Jewish tea merchant Marcus Tertius Moses, whose Dublin shop is mentioned in Wandering Rocks, and who also appears in Bloom's memory in Circe. Through his father's amateur music career, Joyce was acquainted with Joseph and Samuel Levinston, who taught piano and violin at their Dublin studio, the location of which is alluded to in the Lestragonians episode. Joyce's friend and model for Cranley in a portrait, John Francis Burns, introduced, to him, introduced him to Moses Zacks, who was a practicing Jew, a champion chess player, and an amateur scholar. Zacks also may have introduced Joyce to his neighbor, Moses Herzog, whose name and one eye became models for the eponymous figure referenced in the opening of Cyclops. <coughs> Patrick Collum introduced Joyce to William and Henry Sinclair on the occasion of his request to meet Jews who might help him start a continental-style Dublin daily in 1903. Their antique shop, the site of this meeting, is also mentioned by Bloom and Lestragonians. Quote, or will I drop into old Harris's and have a chat with young Sinclair? End quote. A line that represents Joyce's fascination with the 1906 divorce trial of the brother's grandfather, Moses Harris, who formerly owned the shop. While their father was Protestant, these brothers were raised Jewish, as were the majority of these contacts. Joyce knew, or perhaps knew of, Bella Cohen, the madam of a popular Dublin brothel, who he may have patronized, whom he of course used as the model for the, quote, massive whore mistress of the Circe episode. Finally, Joyce knew of the influential families of Albert and Mendel Altman, whose successful salt and coal businesses, shareholdings with the Freeman's Journal, and election to public offices on the Dublin Corporation Council make them models of a politically engaged Irish Jewishness during the era, and thus perhaps early prototypes for Bloom. Witnessing the residue of the Dreyfus affair during his stay in Paris from 1902 to 1903, and then setting up his life as an expatriate in Trieste, 
Joyce eventually came to view the assimilated urban Jew of Europe as a focal point of the most volatile social issues of his day. This kind of Jew is often the product of conversion and acculturation within the centers of fin de siècle thought, such as Paris, London, or Berlin. To Joyce, Bloom would represent a Dublin version of this Jew, estranged from Judaic practice, intermarried, but not entirely severed from an ethnic or even spiritual sense of the identity, and so still inwardly Jewish. After his Dublin years, this Jewishness was personified for him in friends and acquaintances such as the previously mentioned Italio Svevo, Theodora Mayer, Moses Lugash, Leopoldo Popper, Popper and, other friend, and others he befriended in Trieste during his composition of Ulysses. In interrogating his own culture, Joyce seized upon the idea of recreating this Jewish position in Dublin's wandering bloom. Mr. Hunter's Day, the title of a final story for Dubliners he had planned but ultimately dropped in lieu of the dead, was Joyce's first blueprint for that project. And the never-to-be-written piece beca probably became the germ of the Cyclops episode of Ulysses. Joyce continued to befriend Jews while living in Zurich and Paris and gained as confidants, advisors, and even secretaries such highly assimilated Jewish figures as Weiss, Rudolf Goldschmidt, Edmund Brachbar, Paul Leon, and more. Unlike other members of his circle, Joyce was delighted when his only son married Helen Castor Fleischmann, a scion of one of New York's wealthier Jewish families, and kept, a warm, kept up a warm correspondence with both the couple and members of her family for years. In one such letter in 1934, Joyce remarked that while his wife and Maria Jolis attended the Fale's Bajer, he and Eugene Jolis, quote, went to see a Palestine company play called Jacob and Rachel in Hebrew, not Yiddish. It was remarkable, he noted, but barbaric. <laughs> As a young man, Joyce, of course, became obsessed with the paralyzing political and religious forces of his own Irish legacy. When he began socializing with Jews, he discovered, as I mentioned previously, a similar ambivalence toward their own ethnic backgrounds. Recognizing this parallel, he displaced onto his growing conception of Jewishness his own conflicts towards being an apostate, expatriated, sexually liberated Irishman, indeed towards what he would call his own Irishness. This dynamic became the ground of the indefatigable ambiguity of Bloom's Jewishness. Although such projection is often essential to stereotyping, Joyce's Jew is neither stereotypical nor consciously anti-Semitic. While Joyce sometimes turns stereotype, stereotype on its head, uh, for example, taking a traditionally negative Jewish shrewdness and making it a positive attribute in Bloom, his Irish Ulysses is ultimately a mosaic of representations of Jewishness Joyce absorbed in Ireland and on the continent. The selection is made even more complex through how these assumptions are weighed in Bloom's critical imagination. Rather than fixing the Jew as a static racial type, Ulysses presents a spectrum of anti-Jewish myth, Judaic concepts, even avodah, ritual laws, for analysis. These range from the satanic blood libel Jew of medieval legend to the vengeful usurer of literature to gender racial degeneracy to economic exploitation and social pariahism on the negative side to Jew the Jewish messianic impulse, Judaic prudence, Jewish humaneness and earthiness, to the hope of mitigating Jewish, Jewish alienation through assimilation, socialism, or Zionism on the positive side. But given his error, the racial assumptions in that mix certainly presented the most difficult hurdle for Joyce. Aside from traditional stereotypes of Jews as greedy, cowardly, and subversive, the more controversial aspects of Joyce's racial sense of Jewishness revolve around Bloom's timidity, compassion, sexual passivity, and fantasies of submission and bisexuality. Coupled with his reputation as a cuckold, all of these qualities suggest Bloom was shaped in part by theories of a Jew Jewish sexual degeneracy Joyce encountered most prominently in the work of the Viennese psychobiologist Otto Weininger. Weininger's opus, Geschlecht und Character, Sex and Character, 1903, argued that the racial nature of the male Jew was genetically and problematically feminine as compared to his European male counterpart. Inversions of gender roles and allied behaviors were a growing concern of fin de siècle liberalism and eventually became central to the racist cultural dynamic of the Jew. And when I say the Jew and use quotation marks, I mean the sort of figure or the stereotype of the Jew. <laughs> 
Throughout Ulysses, Blue's masculinity is made suspect by other characters because his reputation as a gentle, verbose, teetotaling cuckold. Their perception of him as, quote, a cultured all-around man who has, quote, a touch of the artist about him and who is Greeker than the Greeks, half and half, neither fish nor flesh, a mixed middling, a pishog, are all associated to what those characters believe is his racially effeminate Jewish nature. Bloom's Jewishness in the Gentile gaze thus acquires the disconcerting attraction repulsion often discussed in contemporary gender theory in terms of the male gaze at the female object. Joyce consciously inflected Bloom's Jewish, Jewish otherness in this manner to encompass the nexus of gender and race that had transformed religious anti-Jewishness during his era into modern anti-Semitism. But as the product of a colonized culture, Joyce understood race first and foremost as a subcategory of imperialism and later reciprocally of certain kinds of nationalism. As a less than virile Jew, Bloom is thus threatening, as an Irishman, to boundaries of gender in Dublin's male-dominated Catholic nationalist culture. In having Bloom struggle as a disturbing other against such forces, Joyce preempted the recent argument that pre-Holocaust European Jewry represents a psychologically colonized people, despite their lack of an embattled territory during the era, a colonization that ran along the axis of time rather than that of geographic space. Bloom represents this colonized psyche, a wounded, shamed, defensive, fragmented identity, whose hybridity can ironically become, in a post-colonial form, its great strength. Yet at times during Bloom's narrative, Joyce seems to differentiate Jewishness from other colonial identity, identities by reemphasizing how multivalent anti-Semitism was across the political spectrum, a Jews alternately as Bolsheviks or international capitalists, for example. Ulysses also reveals through Bloom's reflections how anomalous the idea of a Jewish state was in 1904, based, at a, based as it was on a nation that lacked a, a native language, a territory, or any extent political structure. As Zygmunt Bauman argues, comparative uses of Jewishness to other racial constructs are problematic insofar as Jews were most often perceived as neither a valid nation, nor a conquerable people, nor a cultural transformable identity. And here's a longer quote from Mr. Bauman, who's a, a sociologist whose uh, important book is uh, The Holocaust and Modernity. Quote, Jews were not just like any other nation. They were also unlike any foreigners. They undermine the very difference between hosts and guests, the native and the foreign, and as nationhood became the paramount basis of group self-constitution, they came to undermine the most basic of differences, the difference between us and them. Jews were flexible and adaptable, an empty vehicle, ready to be filled with whatever despicable load them were charged with carrying." End quote. In this vein, Bloom embodies a Jewishness riven by racial, religious, and gender conflicts similar to that of the Irish, and yet, in the end, also suggests a different difference from other racial rhetoric in the novel. But perhaps the, mo the more challenging psychosocial question arises not from how his fellow Dubliners perceive Bloom as a Jew, but how Joyce constructs Bloom's perceptions of himself as a Jew. Does Joyce imply that Bloom's atypical distance from the role of strong-willed, potentially violent, sexually normative, heavy-drinking Irish male is the product of his biologically determined feminized Jewish nature? Or perhaps he's suggesting that it comes from Bloom's internalization of those same racial assumptions. Or maybe from his Judaic-based belief in more nurturing and compassionate roles for patriarchal males than those presented by empire or nation. Elsewhere, in my book, I have argued that Joyce disguised the second two under the cover of the first. For example, in his own fantasies in Circe, Blue's, Bloom perceives himself as, quote, a finished example of the new womanly man, end quote, and associates that state of being to such concepts as the Fotor Judaicus, uh, the, the uh, myth that Jews had a particular and offensive smell to them. And yet, also associate to such notable figures as, quote, Moses of Egypt, Moses Maimonides, and Moses Mendelssohn. My theory has directed me to re-examine association between the era's belief in a racially degenerative Jewish femininity and Bloom, as well as the origins of other models of the Judaic that arise in Bloom's stream thinking. 
One answer to such inquiries is that Bloom clearly possesses a competing set of markers of Jewishness than those that stem from racial discourse. These are discoverable in his memories of his father's admonition, admonitions about the historic plight of Jews, as well as his explanations of Judaic traditions and sensibilities. Uh, some quotes from Ulysses, his son's voice, who left the house of his father and left the God of his father. Poor Papa and his Agata, Pesach, next year in Jerusalem. All that long business about being brought out of the land of Egypt into the house of bondage. Hallelujah. Shema Yisrael at Anai Eloheinu. End quote. These markers gain thematic significance as they are portrayed in Bloom's hope for the Hebraic imperative of nurturing father-son relations, of the humane treatment of the stranger, the widow, the orphan, and the poor, and ultimately his vision of his dead son as a Jewish adolescent in Circe. Joyce once asserted to Frank Budgen that he sometimes thought, quote, it was a heroic sacrifice on the Jews' part when they refused to accept the Christian revelation. Look at them. They are better husbands than we are, better fathers, and better sons, end quote. It appears Joyce wanted his readers to infer that Bloom's prudence, his tenderness, his uxoriousness, his guilt, his messianic daydreams, and perhaps even his freeing sexual fantasies stem from Judaic cultural influences rather than from a, ju a, ju a degenerate racial nature. Yet given Joyce's discussions about Judaism in Trias, the text he read while composing Ulysses, and his obsession with naturalistic detail, it's obvious that, again, he consciously created Bloom as not a halakhic or rabbinic Jew. Bloom's memories and musings on Judaic lore, on halakha, on Jewish history, and on Zionism, however, continually acknowledge his sense of inclusion in the identity that all these suggest, and so imply he has a modern Jewish consciousness despite his lack of rabbinic identity markers. In this respect, one could say he represents the kind of Jew who lives by the spirit rather than the letter of the law. The Jewish thus perceived Bloom as Jewish, but neither through racist nor rabbinic lenses. As regards the racial portrait, Joyce knew this as a pernicious product of imperialist and national prejudices that had similarly disrupted his Irish identity. But there is also sound reason for the religious ambiguity of the second set. If Joyce had made Froom, Bloom Froom, that is, a, a practicing pious Jew, Ulysses could not have conducted his dissection of the modern struggle over racial, gender, nationalist, and ethnic identities. If Bloom was orthodox, he would, ha he, would have re he would have lived a more segregated, insular life in Dublin, a figure much more like most of the Lithuanian Jewish community in the city during his era. If Bloom was from, he would not be married to Molly, would not work at the Freeman's Journal, would not have eaten lunch at Davy Burns, and would not have been in Barney Cairns discussing Sinn Féin politics. He would have lived apart from much of the city's political activities, and would not be a subject through which Joyce could confront racism, quote, when he's at home, end quote. The point of Bloom's putative Jewishness is not simply that people are willing to persecute the Jew even when the subject in question is only nominally Jewish. Rather, it is that Ulysses is an exploration of alienation in both the nationalist culture of Dublin and within Bloom's interiority as it reveals the conflicts of Jewish modernity. On the continent, Joyce was befriended not by observant Jews, but by assimilated ones whose ethnic, religious, and national identities were all in cultural flux. Through such individuals, he became aware of the unique role the Jew played in the rationalist struggle to fix identities within race, gender, and nation, and so combat the fear of modernity skepticism, hybridity, and dissolution of traditional roles. In all of this, in this manner, I believe Joyce constructed Bloom as a kind of black hole of Jewish identity issues he had absorbed as these reflected his own struggle as an expatriated Irishman. Bloom's liberal Zionist, quote, new Bloom Muslim in the Nova Hibernia of the future in Circe, polarized as it is between his waking skepticism and utopian hallucinations, is balanced in Ithaca with Stephen's desire for a practical Irish freedom, quote, and this is Stephen talking in, in Ithaca and Ulysses, the possibility of Irish political autonomy and devolution, end quote. Joyce had his own culturally conditioned theories about Jewishness that, while on occasion relied on positive racial stereotypes, or pos positive racial assumptions, excuse me, nonetheless went beyond the self-hatred of a figure like Weininger. <laughs> 
Tracing Bloom's street and thinking, we discover him validating a Jewishness built from what I have previously called a distilled Judaic worldview, as well as from perceiving himself as intimately attached to Jewish history. More specifically, this identity appears to include for Joyce a pragmatism about social acceptance and economic survival, a knowledge of Judaic doctrine as relevant to one's personal behavior, an empathy toward difference, toward the stranger, the widow, the orphan, a psychosexual openness and recognition of gender neutral qualities, a delight in associative thinking, a messianic hope for social liberation, and a nurturing paternalism beyond the hypermasculinity of Western culture. Joyce also assumes that no portrait of 20th century Jewishness would be complete without some musings over modern Zionism. And let us remind ourselves that Joyce read Zionist literature during the composition of Ulysses, including Theodor Herzl's Die Welt, as well as the influential 1916 collection of essays entitled Zionism and the Jewish Future. Yet while the whole of this list may appear to some people as a kind of liberal humanism with a yarmulke, it bears repeating that even though his politics are related through parody, Bloom's Jewish utopian liberalism still seems in Ulysses privileged over the English liberalism Joyce rejected, and certainly over other European liberalisms that attempted but failed to make Jews acceptable as citizens throughout the continent. It is an understatement that the novel also promotes Bloom's serio-comic vision over later ideologies that made Jews unacceptable as human beings. If Bloom sometimes associates his timidity, self-doubt, loss of a son, and masochistic fantasies with a degenerate Jewish racial nature, he also eventually revalorizes his kindness, his desire to nurture, his dialectical thinking, his caution, his regard for the maternal, and his devotion to Mali as all having positive Judaic roots. As Bloom renegotiates the behaviors racism fixed as degenerative against those of the legacy of his father's erstwhile Judaism, he ultimately liberates himself to become an adjusted male and a self-affirming Irish Jew. As an Irishman who denounced Sinn Féin racism, <clears throat> who lived through Dreyfus, and grew to appreciate precepts of Hebraic doctrine, Joyce understood the impact of Judaism on Jews who were assimilated, secularized, or even apostates or converts. Bloom's enabling Jewish difference drawn from his father's Menschlichkeit teachings and resistant to the hypermasculine, racist, and pre-Vatican II Catholic forces that surround him, suggest a multifaceted Jewish identity beyond all essentialisms. In this manner, Joyce stands alone during his era for constructing a Jewishness that not only reverses the value of the feminized Jew into a progressive masculinity, but suggests that Judaic concepts remain integral to an inclusive and evolving modern version of that identity. In creating Bloom's struggle along these lines, Joyce also implied that those achievements might be used as a roadmap to an evolving and inclusive modern Irishness. Thank you.